Romanticism, the Romantic Poets. Hello everyone. Today we will observe a literary movement known as Romanticism. Now this is a, a, a movement that in the European sense covers poetry, prose, artistry. Today's presentation, however, we're going to we're going to focus and emphasize uh, the particularity of these poetic writers, of two poetic writers that, that we will observe. So let's let's uh, let's begin, and let's begin with some of the uh, characteristics and elements of Romanticism. And you can note some of them already uh, uh, pointed out here. Nature versus industry, Gothic versus classical, and individualism. So the first um, that I'd like to talk about is uh, the Romantics' um, preference or or um, surfacing of the Gothic. Now, it, an interesting observation, and we'll observe actually one of the po poems today, is how it seems that they're subscribing to these classical ideals. It seems like that. However, <clears throat> um, the 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 romantic writers they can't cla they can't subscribe to the classical ideals because the majority of of um, romantic writers, at least the ones we'll observe, their belief is Christianity. You know, they they're the the Christian ideal, and so if you think in the monotheistic sense, uh, this differentiates itself from the classical ideal, right? You know the the, the mythological preference of you know uh, many gods, so to speak. And now, granted, even during classical times, this idea of gods versus God was also questioned and challenged in the philosophical sense. You know, Socrates certainly questioned that ideal and, and was noted therefore by you know um, philosophers after him but um, in the literary spectrum you think of Homer you know um, myth the mythological ideal was was immense well not so for the romantics the romantics it's this it's it's this gothic essence right um but it's not just Gothic in the in the belief sense, but it's also Gothic in the in the uh, ecological, right, in the in the societal sense, and um, also in terms of the artistic sense, right, the landscape, and and so they did prefer this notion that I the nightmarish, the mysterious, um, and I I would argue that. This goes in line with the Romantics' uh, preference of individualism. Now, um, every most literary movements are a response to some other literary movement, and the the this idea of the Gothic, of the nightmarish, of the mysterious, I think is is a push to expand. Um, a writer or an artist's sense of individuality. And it allows them to broaden themselves in that sense. Um, you know, to explore the mystery of, of, of one's inner sense of being. Now, it's just one aspect. Now, it, this goes, this, this is slightly different to previous movements that emphasize a, a, that your subscription should be to the state or this your subscription should be to you know should be nationalistic right um well that takes away the the mystery of things right it's already laid out you know this is this is what the belief spectrum should show you well not the romantics the romantics said look you know the individual should be centerpiece um in the humanistic sense you know, sometimes you, we sacrifice the individual um, in order to heighten, you know, the state or the society, right? 
Um, so for them, it's more humanistic to to center the individual at center stage. This also goes in line with the sublime, right? You know, so in the classical sense, the 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 one of, one of the reasons I say it seems that these classical ideals still linger with some of the romantics, but um, why is that? Well, because some of the classical writers um, also spoke about this inner sense of spirit, you know, an inner soul, so to speak. You know, um, not in the Christian sense, but in the, you know, in the, in the classical sense that we have this inner being um, that that should be acknowledged, and not just the the outer shell that embodies. Uh, the spirit or the soul. Well, for the Romantics, the you know the spirit is essential. You know, one of the writers that we'll observe in a little bit, William Blake. Uh, you know, spirituality is is utmost, but so is it in other writers like Wordsworth. The other writer will observe. So they they promoted the sublime, and and with the sublime came. It, it seems like that you've got these inferences of, of mythology and maybe it maybe it maybe it, it does maybe it is purposeful in that sense but again the sublime is again exploring this idea of the mysterious beyond what is known without without um, um stepping on to you know the the broadness of mythology right um the myth, the the romantics also emphasize a necessity of nature. Now, again, remember, it's a literary movement in response, uh, you know, to to other particular ideals. So, um, at this time, the industrial revolution was was up and coming, and in, in, in some senses, quite advanced. Um, so, the romantics felt that rather than subscribe to this idea of progress and advancement, they actually felt that it was more detrimental to society. Well, sure, it seems like we're advancing, but look what it's doing to us. You know, look at these children working on factories. Look at families being displaced. Look at my, look at my inability to survive anymore because my agrarian landscape, right? has been displaced by disindustrial landscapes. Can't grow my own crops anymore. Can't can't sustain my own livestock because I now have to be submissive to this corporate entity of the factory. Uh, well the the romantics came about and said, look, you're destroying the the, the you know the, the organic nature of humanity. Uh, and it's quite compromising. Lifespans, you know, if you got to live 45, you're, you're living a full life. Um, so this, these are some of the elements, right, of individuality, elements of, of the Gothic and of nature. So this leads us into to our first writer, William Blake. Now, Blake was an immensely talented individual. Not only was he a poet, but he was also a painter, an engraver, a printmaker. Uh, I mean, he was immensely talented. Now, ironically, and despite the immense influence of his, of his, uh, both of his writing and of his artistry, he was generally unrecognized in his, in his lifetime, even despite his best efforts. It's generally un, unrecognized, and today... He's one of the utmost canonized romantic writers. So, so that's interesting. I mean, what an immensely talented individual. And he, he wasn't recognized the way some of these other romantic writers were, were observed. He did grow up in London uh, and spent most of his life in London, uh, with the exception of about a three-year span in a place called Felpham. Um, and, and, of course, he's growing up in this, you know, this, this thriving city, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, this, this, despite his um, diversity of experiences um, in the city, right, he, 
he was noted as a very Christian, an individual of which uh, Christianity was of um, primordial importance. Now, despite his um, sense of spirituality, he was very critical of the Church of England. And, and so that seems ironic because you say, well, gosh, well, how is he a Christian critical of the Church of England? Or maybe not ironic at all. Maybe maybe you you understand uh, his um, his following here. But what he felt was that the Church of England was focused more on institutional um, characteristics. You know it, that it had these in, more institutionalized characteristics rather than these humanistic slash spiritual characteristics. You're not. You're not emphasizing a person's soul to your church. You're emphasizing the institution of the church, almost like a business, right? And so, and so, um, Blake was very critical of this, and it's noted in some of his poetry, um, of which he faced some criticism by by the church. Um, Thankfully, you know, Blake wrote in a time when, when I guess, um, um, you, you had a little bit more uh, freedom of expression, but still, it, it was not without caution, right? Uh, and I and I think what what kept um, Blake at bay was the fact that he said, "Look, I'm criticizing the church because, prefer primarily because I am Christian." And I believe that the church simply isn't doing a good job of promoting an individual sense of spirituality. He wrote a, a book. He wrote a, 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 a um, his poetry collection um, came about in the writing of a of an almost like an it's not necessarily an anthology, but it, it's this um, a collection of poems in two parts. Songs of Innocence and of Experience, um, showing the two contrary states of the human soul. So he, he's the, the, um, the essence of this work is that he shows two elements of human nature. He shows, of course, Songs of Innocence, shows this, the essence of innocence in human nature. And he also shows the essence of experience, a little bit more, a bit more of a darker side of our, our human sense of being. Now, this piece is considered one of the most extraordinary poetic collections, and it was a piece, it was a is a is a uh, creation that um, Blake composed solely of himself, right? Or through himself, the poetic compositions of and the writing is product of William Blake. The artistic creations are product of William Blake. Right? The 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 um, the forming of these um, of these um, um, poetic collections, sewn and 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 crafted. By means of William Blake. Now, did he? He did have some influential help from his wife, you know, helped him with the production and stuff like that. But the creation, right? The artistry, the writing, you know, the the um, the forming of this was all through William Blake. There's there's only twenty four copies known to exist, and if you get yourself in a on a an original. William Blake of Songs, Songs of Innocence and of Experience, you've got yourself a gold mine. I mean, the, these are um, these are very unique pieces. So, what this uh, poetic collection does again, it's divided in two parts. It's divided between this notion of innocence and this notion of experience. Um, and according to Blake, it's it's the being of the human soul. Now, I should speak a little bit about uh, his critique of the the Church of England. 
And, and that's if you, if you, if you consider and, and if you think about, uh, and uh, you know what, what the church would tell you, at, at least historically, in you know the, the, the previous context of the the influence of uh, of the church on on uh, humanity was that you've got to you've got to try your best to to maintain a sense of innocence all throughout your life. You've got to maintain the sense of innocence. You've got to be Christ like. Well, Blake, interestingly, in his composing of this of this artistic work, he he shows look. God, in a sense, made us innocent, but He also made us this other way. As we gain experience, our 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 sense of being shifts a little bit, right? Uh, so let's observe. Let's observe. We, we're going to observe uh, two of uh, a couple of several of uh, of uh, Blake's pieces, and then we'll talk about them as as we go through them. And the first of them is is the Lamb now. The Lamb is a is a piece written in his um, in the first part of his uh, uh, poetic composition, known as Songs of Experience, and he wrote this in 1789. So this is the first of the um, the Songs of Innocence was written before Songs of Experience. So it's interesting he would write these series of poems prior to a parallel series of poems. That, that was later later written in songs of experience. Okay. So this first one is called the Lamb. And I'll go ahead and read it. Little Lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed. By the stream and o'er the mead. Gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing woolly bright. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the vales rejoice. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee, little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name. For he calls himself a lamb. He is meek and he is mild. He became a little child. I a child and thou a lamb. We are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. So this is this is Blake's the lamb. And several, uh, one interesting marker about... Um, the lamb is, you notice that it's very, there's a sense of notable innocence. I mean, it, it certainly falls in, in line with the, with the labeling of this, um, of, of, of songs of, songs of innocence. Uh, but it also has that inference, right? That inference of, of the Christian ideal of Christ, where, you know, he says, you know, little lamb who made thee, she's noting this, this, this promoting this notion of the of creator and inferencing, uh, you know, because he says, um, I'll tell you, right? You know, little lamb, I'll tell thee. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. Do you know who made you? you know, I'll tell you, <laughs> right? And, and he says, he's called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. So the lamb... Um, is referencing both um, the Creator, God, and it's also referencing that God made us in His liking. He also made us innocent. So we too are innocent. Right? So in the, in the essence of a child, you know, the, the, the annotation would be that... Um, we are very much godlike in maintaining that sense of innocence, right? but so don't forget this. I mean, notice that he's he's just covering this aspect of innocence um, in describing a, a human sense of nature. So our 
our nature, this nature of innocence, is in fact embodied within us. So this is interesting because in Songs of Experience, which he wrote later, right, 1794, this work of the Lamb is paralleled with a work, <clears throat> work called the Tiger. And and so let's note. Um, let's go ahead and read it, and let's notice, you know, how the tiger compares to the lamb, uh, and we'll also try to acknowledge some of the similarities. So, this is the tiger. Tiger, tiger, burning bright, in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye, could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies Burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art Could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, What dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what that grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who make the lamb, did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? This beautiful poetry. And, 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 what's, and what's being noted in the tiger is that, whereas in Songs of Innocence, humans are, or human entities are, are created with an essence of innocence, right? Childlike innocence. This piece in Songs of Experience is now noting that we're also made with a sense of um, that we also have the capacity to to be to promote a, a sense of fear, right? Um, to pre, to pre, you know to be not so innocent anymore, you know. What the ad what, 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 what it says? What the anvil? What dead grasp? There, its deadly terrors clasp. It's like, oh gosh, you know, is, <laughs> is that human? Is are those human entities? Well, yes, they are. I mean, whether we want to admit it or not, we're, we're not we're not so innocent at times. Right, you know, we we observe our sense of being and we compare it. Uh, Where we can humans can be very scary creatures. So, what what's that? What's uh, uh Blake's? What's um, uh, Blake promoting? Well, he says, you know, humanity. It's, it yes, it's made with this essence of innocence. But guess what? It's also made with this essence of fear and terror. You know, God, and God made us this way. So the same creator who made the child, the lamb, also made the tiger. So this creator, you know, he, he creates us, he balances us between this, you know, good and not so good promotion. So this is, this is, uh, you know, the songs of innocence, the lamb, songs of experience, the tiger. So let's observe another another composition, and now this one's we're, we're going to go back to Songs of Innocence, and this one's called the Chimney Sweeper. Now remember, if, if you think about nature versus industry, um, and so and so Blake writes this piece, the Chimney Sweeper, in line with the with the ecological context of the time, where you know the Industrial Revolution came in and. Um, Affected, affected um, the way in which um, families interrelated with one another. You know, the, the economic and social conditions were were terrible. 
Um, so let's read it and we'll talk about it a little bit. So this is called The Chimney Sweeper by, by Blake. <clears throat> when my mother died, I was very young, and my father sold me while yet my tongue could scarcely cry, weep, 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 weep. So your chimneys I sweep, and in suit I sleep. There's little Tom DeCray, who cried when his head, that curled like a lamb's back, was shaved, so I said. Hush, Tom, never mind it, for when your head's bare, you know that the suit cannot spoil your, your white hair. And so he was quiet that very night, as Tom was asleeping, he had such a sight that thousands of sweepers, Dick, Joe, Ned, and Jack, were all of them locked up in coffins of black. And by came an angel who had a bright key, and he opened the coffins and set them all free. Then down a green plain, leaping, laughing, they run, and wash in a river and shine in the sun. Then naked and white, all their bags left behind, they rise up on clouds, sport in the wind. And the angel told Tom, if he'd be a good boy, he'd have God for his father and never want joy. And so Tom awoke, and we rose in the dark, and got with our bags and our brushes to work. Though the morning was cold, Tom was happy and warm, so if all do their duty, they need not fear harm. Okay. Well, this is the the chimney sweeper, and, and you can see the the you know the the terrible analogy that's inferred here that children don't have much to look forward to except death, right? But in in that state of innocence, death is promising because. Um, it doesn't matter if you die. You know God's going to take care of you. You know He's He's going to be your father, and everything's going to be fine. So, um, were children sold during the time? Yes, they were. You know, ju ju children were not only sold; children were definitely, de you know, directly orphaned by some parents. Who, the parents, I guess, you know, it's so it's so, it's quite easy for us to criticize the parents, but. This is something to think about. You know, it's, I'm not saying it's right either, but um, some parents literally said, "Look, you, you stay with us. You're gonna die. You, you know, your your chances of survival are are better on your own." You know, and that sounds like you know, ironically terrible, but. How? How in the world is a child going to survive on their own? Well, some of these children resorted to working in the factories, you know, working as chimney sweepers and sort of stuff. So, um, they were they were um, exposed to these terrible working conditions, and um, um, so the 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 story, right? The story. In the innocent sense, right? This is kind of the the portrayal that that Blake is promoting. That children don't quite have that that experience sense analogy, right? They're growing up before their time, of course. But as children, you're you're not quite. We have this innocent understanding of the world, right? Um. So it promotes a lot of questions, right? About you know, a child's psychology about, are they, are we in fact innocent? Right? Um, as children, you know, the realities of the world are, you know, is, is, is our, is it psychologically healthy to maintain this livelihood of hope um, under the Christian umbrella? Right, this is, so this is what Blake's getting at, right? Uh, in the innocent sense. Well, in Songs of Experience, he parallels this um, this poem. He parallels it with a with another one of the, of the same title, um, called the Chimney Sweeper. And let's observe this one 
in Songs of Experience. So it's called The Chimney Sweeper. A little black thing among the snow, crying weep, weep in notes of woe. Where are thy father and mother, say? They are both gone up to the church to pray. Because I was happy upon the heath and smiled among the winter snow, they clothed me in the clothes of death and taught me to sing the notes of woe. And because I am happy and dance and sing, they think that they have done me no injury and are gone to praise God and his priest and king who make up a heaven of our misery. So you notice here, I mean, the, the, the message now is much different, right? I mean, this is now someone, you know, still a child, it seems, but uh, under songs of experience, um, here he says, look, here I am, I'm, I'm, I'm a chimney sweeper, <laughs> and I'm... Um, and, um, um, I'm dealing with the the hardships of being a chimney sweeper, and and so my parents, you know, they're over in church, and, and they think that if they see me in this light of happiness, um, that there's no sense of injury, right? That they've they've in a sense done me no harm, so to speak. Um, but let's be real about it. You know, there they are, and and again, church probably uh, implying the Church of England, um, this institution of whose God and priest and king is praised, um, they make up a heaven of our misery. Right? You know, if, maybe Blake is getting at the fact that, hey, look, if if, if you really want to do good. Stop being an institution. Get out there and help these children. Right? Probably easier said than done. I mean, it's so easy for us to, to be critical in the sense of things here. But um, you notice the, the message is a little different, right? It's not so... That sense of hopefulness is not quite as as colorful, right? Um this one's a little bit more, a little darker, right? A little, a little bit more. Um, um, the metaphorical context is one of of um, slight pessimism as opposed to optimism. And so you, you notice here, you know, the, the the writings of Blake here are are, whereas you have this state of innocence. Uh, um, the lamb and the tiger, you know, the state. Whereas we have a sense of human nature of innocence, we also have a sense of human nature of fear and terror and and, and not so innocent anymore. Well, same thing with the chimney sweeper, you know. In a state of innocence, the chimney sweeper says, it's okay. It's okay because, you know, in, in, in the aftermath of death, it's going to be God is my father, God is my savior. It's going to be fine. And and got songs of experience. This is what do you, you know? Who is this so-called savior, right? You know, I'm, I'm I'm in this clothing of I'm clothed in death, right? I'm, I'm miserable. Um, so if you want to get a um, expand your 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 um, poetic knowledge of William Blake and observe some of his beautiful poetry. Um, you can observe the Blake Archive, and it's got this beautiful collection, not just of his poetry, but also of his artistry. And you notice as we went through some of the slides, you see the differences. Same same, um, same picture, it seems like, but we, different colorings of sorts. Right? Okay, well, our next, um, our next romantic writer, next romantic poet, is William Wordsworth. And... Um, Unlike uh, Blake, Wordsworth, he did not grow up in London. He grew up in a, a smaller town called Cockermouth, Cumberland, England. Um, 
Now, Wordsworth, he's he's known for his um, what's considered his magnus opus, his masterpiece, is a composition called the Prelude, and um, it's also noted as like poems to to Coleridge, right? Poems for Coleridge. His friend Samuel Taylor Coleridge, also a poet. Alongside Wordsworth, alongside Blake, these three were noted as the founders of, or, or some of the most iconic founders of the Romantic literary movement. Now, also unlike uh, um, Blake, you know, um, not growing up in this big epicenter city, he was by far much more successful, at least um in the economic sense he was poet laureate you know acknowledged by 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 the uh, uh, by the monarchy as you know uh, um, being a a credible writer and so he wrote not only for himself he also wrote for for the monarchy for the aristocrats and he also supported the church of england uh, you know, it's probably not in his best interest to be so critical of it. Maybe this tells you why, why maybe Wordsworth is probably way much more acknowledged than Blake because um, Wordsworth seemed to know how to play the game. Or even if he didn't know, he, you know, by means of survival, he said, he told himself, well, you know, if I want to survive, I better make a name for myself. So, you know, his, his, his support of the Church of England um, um, I guess accredited him a certain sense. Now, this is interesting because some of um, Wordsworth's earlier writing seemed to be with that same critical those same critical tangents that um, 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 Blake had. But, you know, and we'll look at some of his poetry in a little bit, but later on in his, in his life, um, Wordsworth, rather than being more revolutionary, seemed to be more, um, you know, um, not necessarily status quo, I would say, but he, he seemed to be linked more in line with, you know, with the state and with the church, so to speak. So regardless, his, his poetry is still notably um, um, influential and beautiful, if you will. So let's observe some of uh, Wordsworth's poetry. Uh, this is a poem, again, going in line with that theme of nature as opposed to um, industry. Uh, let's take a look. This one's called The World is Too Much. Wor the, world, the world is too much with us. The world is too much with us, late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours, we have given our hearts away a sordid boon, the sea that bears our bosom to the moon, the winds that will be hauling at all hours, and are up gathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn. So might I, standing on this pleasantly, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn, have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. This beautiful poem, one of my favorites of um, of um, Wordsworth, and 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 as we go as you go through it, he's generally saying, "Is look, you know, we're 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 destroying the world, so to speak. Right? We're destroying ourselves." Um, th that statement, "The world is too much with us," that in itself is already a, you know an inferencing. Uh, the way he's laying out the, the the message of this this poem, 
Well, he uses a little bit of irony. I mean, the, um, where he says, um, you know, when he when he relates um, um, humans, when one gives away your heart, you know, it's it's quite a, 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 a respectable sense of thing. You know, you, you give your heart away. You're very you're given, but then it says a sordid boon. You know, this is um, you're being quite. You're not being so smart about. You're not being so smart about it, right? To give your heart away in that sense, and then he uses personification to to heighten this element of nature, right? You know, the the sea burying her bosom, the winds howling, the flowers sleeping, right? Uh, and and so the beauty, the 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 lifefulness of nature. He he says we're out of tune with it, and if that's the case, then guess what? I'd rather be. That's why I say you know that this that that there seems to be this subscription with nature, and he says I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn. I'd I'd rather be a part of this, you know. Um, um, this mythological creed, right, where he says, you know, I, I, I have have sight of Proteus, the sea god, or or Triton, you know, another god of the sea. Both of these Proteus and Triton are mythological figures, you know, mythological gods, if you will. And he says, I'd rather be part of that belief system if it maintains our sense of nature. Because you know, in classical times, industry wasn't destroying the matter. Um, so, to, hey, of course he's not being he's not being literal, of course, um, but the message is clear. You know, in, in today's context, in today's industrial context, look, we're destroying that beauty that was certainly present during classical times. So this is the world is too much with us, right? And you see the. The use of again, like Blake, very metaphorical personification, right? Reference certain references to to those mythological gods, um, but more importantly, the 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 necessity to maintain um, nature. How do we sustain nature amidst this consumist, you know, these these uh, uh, this umbrella of consumerism and so-called progress, if you will. Uh, this other poem, London 1802, has some of those same um, elements that that Wordsworth had in uh, The World is Too Much With Us. So this one references a figure, uh, a key figure during the Enlightenment period called Milton. And Milton was a, was a he's the famous writer of a composition called Paradise Lost. I mean, one of the most canonized and interestingly influential pieces of uh, literature. So Milton was part of a uh, revolutionary movement um, called the Commonwealth in which they wanted to um, dethrone the the monarchy. He want, they wanted to remove the king from power and create a, a republic. Create a create a, a system of government that was led by the people, rather than led by by the the monarchy. Um, did it succeed? It succeeded initially. You know, there there was a there was a time when uh, England did in fact become a republic, but then shortly it was very short lived. Very short, sh you know. Shortly thereafter, returned back to to being a monarchy. Um, regardless, this is a, a, a poem in which uh, Wordsworth is giving Milton a great deal of reverence and respect uh, and stating that in 1802 at least, hey, you know, we need to be like Milton and what's wrong with us? We've got, pow we've got problems. So let's go through it. Milton, thus shalt be living at this hour. England had need of thee. She is a fen of stagnant waters, 
altar, sword, and pen, Fireside, the heroic wealth of Holland Bower, Have forfeited their ancient English dower Of inward happiness. We are selfish men, O oh, raise us up, return to us again, And give us manners, virtue, freedom, power. Thy soul was like a star, and dwelt apart, Thou hadst a voice, whose sound was like the sea, Pure as the naked heavens, majestic, free. So didst thou travel on life's common way, In cheerful godliness, and yet thy heart The lowliest duties on herself did lay. There's another beautiful poem. And, and so this one's saying, look, England, or, you know, citizens of England, you know, we're all stagnant both in terms of, you know, our sense of faith, altar, our, 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 you know, our sense of service and our sense of, you know, artistry, creativity, pen, right? We're all stagnant in all aspects, you know, in, in, in creed and in service and artistry, we're all stagnant. Um, and we're, why? Because we're selfish. Right? We're, what are we doing? You know, we're, 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 we're our interests probably inferencing a little bit of the ideals in the previous form of consumerism. You know, the our 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 our, our sense of being is different, right? Virtue, freedom, power, it's it's um it's not what it it's not what it was. So he returns back to Milton and he says you know, the metaphorical you, in poetry, you have because things are not so literal. Metaphor is a literary device that these writers use quite often, uh, and so um, Wordsworth he regards Milton um, as this gentleman with all these virtues, right? All these, all these almost heroic characteristics and and he, and he ends really interestingly but he says you're not acting Milton's not acting like this pompous individual in fact um, he says you know you travel you were happy you travel in cheerful godliness and yet thy heart the lowliest duties on herself did lay so in the end you were you were you're very humble about it, right? Because you you undertook these these low responsibilities, right? You know the, the, the these um, these aspects of being that maybe by today's standards, eighteen oh two, the English citizen is too proud or 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 um, you know. You've got these different ideals, right? Um, I kind of parallel a little bit um, with the manner in which the media, right? Like today, the media kind of gives a, a message of uh, material exceed, excessive materialism, right? So we're we're not we're not culturally up to date. If, if we haven't consumed certain things, right? And so if we haven't consumed certain things and we're not up, up to bay a certain way, um, we're not, you know, we're not up to par with the Joneses, if you will. Um, and, and so what do we do? You know, rather than be humble and, 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 and keep, preserving maybe things that are a little bit more meaningful like education you know a, a, a sense of communitarianism of service even of creativity right where creativity is not for commercial aspects but rather for for a, a sincere life message if you will um, then where we too are in need of Milton Right, of an influence like Milton. Okay. Well, I hope this helps you. I mean, we've observed some of the poetry of William Blake and Wordsworth, and there's many other romantic poets. 
but I think for today, anyways, um, I hope this presentation gives you some insights as to the Romantic movement, Romantic influence, and and um, the manner in which the the poetry of these Romantic poets um, um, formed itself, right. And, and so then came about to promote these issues of nature, of individualism, um, of the Gothic portrayal, if you will. All right. I hope this, um, this gave you some good insights um, as to the poetry of these romantic poets. And I hope you enjoyed. Thank you.